If you're conscious of something, you can hinge policy on it in a way that you can't if, you're, if it's unconscious. In both cases, there are effects. But if you're conscious of it, you can set up in advance a policy which says, well, I must remember not to do X, or I must remember to do X when I see Y. Only if you consciously see Y can you set up such a policy. So there is a very clear case where becoming conscious of a stimulus makes a huge difference in what you can do with it. You know, if we have to choose between the first person point of view and the third person point of view, then I'm strongly of the opinion that we naturalists should choose the third person point of view when they're in conflict. Yes, yes. yes. but there's no such thing as a third person point of view other than as the result of a bunch of first person points of view. I mean, let's not forget that the way we, we interpersonally verify things, because we all go through a process of conscious analysis of, you know, whatever, I'm reading the, the paper, I'm thinking about the paper, I'm responding to the paper, and so on and so forth. So, yes, one needs to be very careful. It's, it's similar to, to the, the, you can make the same exact argument for color perception. Oh, we know that, or perception in general. We know that we can be mistaken perception, therefore we should go all around blind because we can't trust it. No, we don't have that option. We just don't, and I don't think we have it in the case of consciousness either. It's a good thing to be careful and, and aware, consciously aware, of the fact that there are limits and, and, and systematic biases and all that sort of stuff, but you, can't, you just can't go at, around doing anything, including having these discussions, without it. So I'm not understanding why all these ganging up on consciousness thing. Um, well, where does that come from? Sort of, but no, but I mean, look, it's, it's a perennial issue in the behavioral sciences, right? Should we... We, we often have conflicts between what subjects report sure. and our interpretations of how subjects behave. So that's, I assume, what, uh, what Alex is getting at when he talks about conflict between third-person evidence and first-person sure. evidence. And, I mean, I think the, the history of the behavioral science overwhelmingly tells us Alex is right about that, right? Um, yes. You, you always want that behavioral Yes, check. but how do we do the behavioral check? Well, it depends. Lots of different ways, depending on, yeah. yeah. My point was that the behavioral check cannot do without the person's, the, the, the person's checking conscious involvement. Well, that's in one kind of behavioral test you can do. You can ask people what they're conscious of, the heterophenomenology, of third person yeah. science. <clears throat> I mean, psychophysics yeah. uh, re depends on, many experiments depend on, getting subject reports. And uh, perfectly good science. It's relying on their consciousness, but there's all sorts of controls in place. Okay. Is there, is, is there a link between, so reason in the, in the previous session played a big role. I think one of the accounts we gave of free will is sort of has to pass through your reasoning faculty. Is, does it also have to pass through your conscious faculty? If you reason unconsciously, is that somehow not first grade reason? Yes. <laughs> Why is that? Then? It's the difference between. Let me let me say that the reason mm -hmm. I asked the question is, is not the the non rhetorical. Has... It's because when you say that, you are immediately attaching more confidence to consciousness mm -hmm. than I think is warranted on the basis of what we already know about the degree to which it misleads us. Okay. So now. Okay. Of course there is self-deception and rationalization and ideology and, and other sources of misdirection where we fool ourselves, where our own conscious introspections of what we're reasoning are unreliable. But it's also the case that it's only conscious reasoning in which we get to articulate carefully and to evaluate and to, to um, I'm trying to think, is it Hume who, who talks about sort of turning the reasons over in your mind and, and really reflecting on them. It is only conscious reasoning where the reasons themselves become objects of attention. When you reason unconsciously, you may be a demon, you may do it very fast, but you have no way of assessing the reasons themselves. They play the role they do uh, covertly, in effect. Whereas when you reason with yourself, when you consciously reason with yourself, 
To put it bluntly, it's like reasoning with another person. You now have a witness. And if you, if you recognize that sometimes the best way you're trying to solve a problem, sometimes the best way of doing it is to find a, a sympathetic interlocutor and say, tell me what you think of this reasoning. But then is it, is it, are you saying that it's... And then we do that with ourselves. So the, 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 the reason that you should um, associate the best reasons with conscious reasoning is just because they happen to be more reliable in general because they have this kind of turning over property. Is that what you're saying? Yes, uh, they're, they're more reliable precisely because they are actually tested in a certain way that unconscious reasons aren't tested. They well, are, they are making... Gregorian creatures to coin for they, 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 mm -hmm. are, uh, they are subjected to a certain sort of quality control that unconscious reasons aren't.